Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode here at the Damage Report. Still with that old busted intro that I keep saying I'm gonna replace, but clearly I'm not going to. But we do have something to look forward to, and that is Jason Carter. Jason, how's it going? Um, John, first, I'm glad to be back. Secondly, for all the dragons out there, I am um, in the midst of a Florida summer with no air conditioning in my new home, and every door in my house is open, and I am spitzing um, out of control. But I'm good. Other than that, I'm great, mm -hmm. John. Glad to be back. And oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. Introducing my newest coffee <laughs> addiction. Kirkland cold brew coffee, no calories, no sugar, completely boring. And it's supposed to be allegedly reportedly, there are claims that this is healthier for you. So I'm here for it, we're giving it a whirl. But yeah. this may be the last time it makes an appearance on the damage report, so savor it now. So you're you're enjoying that more than like the monster in the morning? Well, <laughs> yeah, I had to give up the monster because I was reading that it makes certain things not work anymore. And um, I'm not trying to venture down that lane anytime soon. So I had to, you know, so John, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I need to Google. I need to Google. <laughs> anyway, um, I thought it just gave you a heart attack, but now it's gotten serious. Right. Anyway, no. well, we're, we're glad to have you here uh, in the Florida heat. Uh, glow. All he's doing is glowing more, so that's cool. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm kind of cold, and I look sweatier than he does. So that's well, cool. Anyway. Hey. John, look, I would take you looking sweatier and having incredible lighting than me being forced to be in front of a door hoping for the, the clouds to part oh. to illuminate all of my melanin. So the struggle is real on both your lighting. <laughs> Shut up, your lighting looks great. Anyway, thank you everybody for being here for our talk. Um, if you are new to the show, it's uh, 90 minutes uh, every weekday about energy drinks and perspiration. Um, it's kind of popular, weirdly, we thought it would be niche. But anyway, um, we got a lot of news for you. We're gonna be diving into the beginning of the testimony and the investigation of the attack uh, on January 6th. And it has been wild, um, some of the reactions have been even more wild. So get ready for a whole bunch of that. Then, did you know the, the Olympics are going on? I know it's a sports thing, but I looked it up and it is happening. We've got some big developments on that as well. Uh, I love this once every four years a reason that I actually want to talk sports. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna see how much Jason has been following it. So that'll be fun. <laughs> and then like, what can you expect when it comes to masks and vaccine mandates coming up? We're gonna see great stuff having to do with Matt Gates. Um, members of uh, that are soon about to be part of his family are uh, owning him on TikTok. So that sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? Well. Uh, if you think so, then don't go anywhere. We got a lot coming up for you. And if along the way you'd like to send us any comments, sweet super chats, or anything like that, uh, we'll respond as we go. Before that, though, if you could hit the like button, that'd be nice. Feel free to share the stream so that people know we're live um, and they can join us and uh, take part in the conversation. But other than that, what do you think of Jason? You ready to uh, jump into this thing? Yeah, well, I mean, with the heat, I might pass out, so we might as well get into it before. I, you know, before <laughs> we have to call the paramedics. The iguanas outside need to call the paramedics for me. Yeah, I hear that the iguanas are coming from inside the apartment, actually. Um, yeah, if we ever go to Jason's shot and it's just empty, he's passed out on the floor, someone please call 911. But anyway, okay, with that, let's jump into this. I think we're going directly into this video. During the assault, I thought about using my firearm on my attackers. But I knew that if I did, I would be quickly overwhelmed. And that in their minds would provide them with the justification for killing me. So I instead decided to appeal to the, any humanity they might have. I said as loud as I could manage, I've got kids. So that is uh, Michael Fanone that you were hearing right there, one of the Capitol Police officers whose body cam footage from January 6th had some of the toughest to watch, toughest to digest footage from that day of him being surrounded by Trump fans who were doing everything they could to murder him. Some assisting him, thankfully, but many attempting to kill him. He thought about using deadly force, decided not to. Obviously, we're glad for that. Cops generally are too eager to do it. In this case, I think that his thought press was, was probably true. If he'd begun firing, I believe that they would have killed him, whether with the gun or otherwise. I think that that would have led to more widespread violence, not just where he was at, but potentially rippling through the crowd. So we're gonna have more of Michael Fanon, but um, Jason, what'd you think about that, that, that well, start with you? 
Uh, John, first of all, I, I couldn't agree with you more um, that him opening fire inside. I mean, this was the, when we the last time we saw this video on the damage report, I got really emotional because, yeah, as he said, as John just said in his testimony, you know, I have children. It's it's a lot to digest, right? Secondly, uh, yeah, agreeing with you 100%. Had he opened fire, more loss of life would have happened. Then another conversation of police brutality would have been um, ushered in in a different way. It would have been it wouldn't have been police brutality against people of color. It would have been some other spun dramatic event of police brutality that would have. Not and it just would have been really bad. I guess is what I'm trying to say. But um, I I think that had I been in that situation, I always put myself. I always tried to put myself in the in the shoes of someone in any misfortune situation. He had to act fast, act quick, and also save his life. And I hats off to him, right? I mean, what 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 else can you? What else do you do in that situation? But try to protect yourself, but also use the training and an exact and an active training that you've been that have been, that has been imbued upon you to do your job. You know, yeah. it's 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 crazy and. The trauma he's reliving again, right? So it's when you have to, you experience it, that's one traumatic event. You're put on the stand, you have to relive that all over again and, and be very clear and concise and to the point of what happened to you. That's also got to be painful, not only for him, but you mentioned rippling effects yeah. for his family and everyone else that's close to him that could have possibly lost this man. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I want to give you a little bit more of him talking um, about what was happening in particular, them trying to take his gun and his. In believing to kill him with it. Some in the crowd stepped in and assisted me. Those few individuals protected me from a crowd and inched me toward the Capitol until my fellow officers could rescue me. I was carried back inside. What happened afterwards is much less vivid. I had been beaten unconscious and remained so for more than four minutes. I know that Jimmy helped to evacuate me from the building and drove me to MedStar Washington Hospital Center, despite suffering significant injuries himself. Okay, so I apologize. I was thinking of a different video, but there um, he does begin the talk about his injuries, including that he had had a heart attack, he had a concussion, a traumatic brain injury, and PTSD. In a little bit, we're gonna be giving you some of the response from right wingers who are watching that. So I just want you to bear in mind how badly he was beaten by. Uh, the MAGA crowd there uh, before we get to that. Um, but that said, let's go to just a little bit more of Michael Fanon and uh, Jason and I will give you our thoughts. What makes the struggle harder and more painful is to know so many of my fellow citizens, including so many of the people I put my life at risk to defend are downplaying or outright denying what happened. I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. But too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. My law enforcement career prepared me to cope with some of the aspects of this experience. Being an officer, you know your life is at risk whenever you walk out the door. Even if you don't expect otherwise law abiding citizens to take up arms against you. But nothing, truly nothing, has prepared me to address those elected members of our government who continue to deny the events of that day. And in doing so, betray their oath of office. And they've been doing it since the event, or to be clear, some of them immediately after the event seemed to get what was going on and were clearly worried about backlash from the electorate. I mean, even you know Kevin McCarthy had said that Trump was responsible for this. But then they collected themselves, they looked out their right wing media and at the MAGA base and, and realized, oh no, wait, they're cool with this. They're gonna run with it. They're fine with it, so now we're fine with it. And so as Michael Fanon was saying, Jason, they have spent all the time up until now, including today, denying that it's serious, that it's something you should worry about. Nothing should be done. It doesn't reflect badly on anyone except, I don't know, maybe Antifa or something. Well, I mean, folks, so visually and audibly listening to Michael's testimony, it's indicative of the treachery that has that, that you know, and then again, people always come at me for entering color into the situation, but marginalized groups of people have been talking about this treachery that's been happening for years, right? We protect veterans 
people who serve our countries do their jobs, protect everyone regardless of their intentions. And yet here's Michael Fanon who was doing his job and was attacked by the same people that he was sworn to protect. And the face of who's saying this, this is a, a cisgender white male, right? This is like the, the, the holy mm-hmm. grail of existence in our country. And he's saying, <laughs> smacking his hand on the table, you all betrayed me, right? You all tried to kill me. John, you may, well, he mentioned, and then you also mentioned that he had PTSD, a heart attack, a concussion, almost died, right? All of those things could have ended his life, and all those things are going to add to the continuous PTSD that he's going to experience from now, probably for, for the rest of his life. So I think it's a very cautionary tale to all of these people who are on that right base that, as you said, they collected themselves and realized, no, we gotta fall back in line. We, we, got, we, got, we, gotta, we gotta get information because we don't want our well being. Mm-hmm to be affected. This is a, a cautionary tale that, yo, there is no loyalty here regardless. And not to, not to mitigate or minimize what he experienced, not at all. I'm just drawing a parallel as to the uh, two-faced nature of these people that are saying, hey, the insurrection on January 6th didn't happen. No homeboy, it did happen. And one of your own, if you will, is saying, I'm a victim of that. Wake up, get yeah. it together. I am the face of that. and. I'm not a dark face. I'm not a brown face. I am a white face. Yeah, no, you're you're 100 right. Uh, the, the testimony is powerful to the extent that people see it. It should be powerful. And and right. supposedly, at least at the beginning, Fox was actually showing what was going on. OAN wasn't. I don't know about Newsmax. We'll see if they stuck with it throughout because there's other cops that came up, and we're going to show you some of their video. Um, but that is powerful. But then, the, like, I don't even think we need like what what he said was great. But just seeing the body cam footage, I think tells the story pretty well. But oh wait, I guess not because that's been out for months and it didn't convince anyone of anything. It's just like, it's the final nail in the coffin of, well, God, if we only had video, it would convince people. I mean, since when has body cam footage convinced supporters of cops anything? In this case, they're against the cops. And again, it's not convenient. We don't like what's on the video, so we're gonna pretend it's not there. That is no way to go through your life. Just because something is inconvenient, you can't just run from it. Except tens of millions of Americans are currently doing that. So another reason why this this testimony is important. And I don't know Michael Fanone, I don't know anything about his politics. All I know (laughs) is that he is saying what happened to him. And I am hoping that people won't be able to deny it. Right, I mean, he has no reason to lie and what if, your question was, okay, you know, the holy grail of receipts, if you will, and the holy grail of mm-hmm. proof is video, right? It's footage. The camera doesn't lie. It's what else do we need? Do we need do we need TikTok, a TikTok challenge? Do we need billboards <laughs> plastered everywhere? Do we need a meme on social media? Do we need YouTube videos? Like, what is it gonna take for people to believe this? Because anyone Anyone watching this, like John, I am not, I consider myself um, a very balanced and not an emotional person. I'm not moved a lot with things. I'm very, very mm-hmm. um, methodical with stuff. When I when I heard that video and saw that video, you were, you guys were here, you guys watching, I was moved to tears by that. That, is, that yeah. was so visceral. Any yes. human being watching that, any politician. Well, get ready. Yeah, it's-, it's Get it's, ready, cuz we got some more, man. Um, it's gonna get rough. Um, but that said, first, uh, Officer Mike Officer Mike Fanone um, was the uh, first to uh, his testimony at the, the Capitol Commission started to go viral. People were really paying attention to it, but not everyone who was paying attention to it was convinced by what he was saying. Now, I want you to bear in mind, this is a police officer who was nearly beaten to death by a crowd of Trump supporters. Trump supporters who say they back the blue, they've got the blue line flag and everything, and then they use it to try to beat cops they don't like to death. So. So that was an ultimate betrayal of that supposed patriotism that they have when it comes to cops. As that's going on, as his footage, his footage is playing live, the most successful and popular host at Newsmax, Greg Kelly, who I'm sure you haven't heard of, but I guess there's millions of conservatives who care what he thinks, tweeted, sorry, but I don't think this guy was ever cut out to be a cop. He's talking about how they nearly murdered him. As he is desperately trying to still do his duty and stop them from getting in and killing elected representatives. Sorry, I don't think he was ever cut out to be a cop. Then he says, is it possible Fanon was mistaken for Antifa? He often for media appearances has worn all black, but no insignia, police patches, rank. Wait, 
So, okay, so it wasn't that they were trying to kill a cop. They were trying to kill Antifa, even though you all think he was being attacked by Antifa. So why are they attacking him at that point? I don't understand that at all. That was just the first two of several more. This guy should have never been out there. He's got a chip on his shoulder. No, he doesn't have a chip on his shoulder. He has a traumatic brain injury because your fans nearly beat him to death. But as it's going on, like I expected Jason, they would just back off. Like, ah, this is gonna be really inconvenient. It's best if we don't even acknowledge it. No, they're going hard against the cops that their fans tried to kill. Right, right, right. It, it, the the lack of human decency. You know, I had a car. I have five. I have five uncles who are police officers in three major metro, metropolitan areas, and I talked to the, I talked to two of them about what happened, and even they said that that is like the scariest thing they've seen. And these people work in major metropolitan areas with some pretty bad crime, right? Also. He's saying that he would be Antifa because he doesn't, he wears black all the time and there's no patches. Well, there's a lot of undercover cops that, you know, that don't wear police uniforms mm-hmm. and have patches and they're very, they're not very clear that, they, that they're law enforcement. What is that, right? These tweets are, can I say bitch on the Young Turks? That's not a bad word, right? You can. You also already did, but yes, you can. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, those tweets are what it's I was. It's too late call, at this point. Yeah, please, FCC, don't come for me. Um, <laughs> those are bitch moves from, from that tweeter. Whose name I will not, he's like Voldemort, he has shall not be mentioned. Um, because again, it goes back to the jettison of the jettisoning of the, of seeing this person's life almost ended, right? You, it, because you're so staunch in how you feel politically and you're so staunch on trying to control, to keep this narrative going instead of, yeah, the lesser two evils, John, would be to just stop talking about it, which is also very egregious. However, I would rather them not say anything than to go hard in the paint and go ham sandwiches and really. Say this guy is not cut out to be a cop who's given his life to being a cop, right? That's probably like the very like fiber and, and, and cellular makeup of his being is being a law enforcement person and gives him yeah. purpose in his life. So you're gonna go to Twitter and say he's not cut out to be a cop. Yo, get behind your keyboard and you go and do what this person does daily. And let me and then then come back and see who's not cut out to be a cop, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're totally right. And by, look, the entire subject is obviously ripe with. You know, like you have this particular incident and then you have it occurring in a context where we're having a general nationwide conversation about policing, about violence of police, about other protests. And and, and many people want to to muddy the waters. Like the the same people who are out today saying you shouldn't be worried about the sixth or whatever, trying to say, but you should be worried about the protests last year, even though this was a crowd ideologically uh, in solidarity with each other, trying to break into a particular location to murder politicians and to destroy property. That's what they were trying to do. Uh, they will pretend that that's what any of the protests were about last year. But of course, that is not true. Th- these, these people were trying to murder the cops. They were trying to beat the cops to death. Nobody at the Black Lives Matter protests were trying to do that. That's not at all what it was about. And I'm just so sick of the, it's, not, it's, like, it's worse than whataboutism. Because what about is sort of in a cowardly fashion asking questions to distract from the topic. This is about like spinning this entire like narrative designed to erase what all of these different individuals and groups try to do last year. And in the and in the midst of it, you know, pretending that there can be some sort of consist consistency in your back the blue thing and being for law and order and doing you know, six months of PR for people who tried to murder these cops. Right. In any event, we do have um, some other cops uh, that, that I want to uh, give you a bit of their testimony. So um, this morning, uh, Sergeant Ganell of the uh, US Capitol Police also talked about what happened to him on the 6th. And here is some of what he had to say. We were suggested, what well, we were suggested that day was like something from a medieval battle. We fought hand to hand, inch by inch to prevent an invasion of the Capitol by a violent mob intent on subverting our democratic process. My fellow officers and I were committed to not letting any rioters breach the Capitol. It was a prolonged and desperate struggle. The rioters attempted to breach the Capitol were shouting, Trump send us, pick the right side. We want Trump. 
I vividly heard officers screaming in agony and pain just an arm length from me. I didn't know at that time, but that was Officer Hodges. And he's here today to testify. I, too, was being crushed by the air riders. I could feel my, myself losing oxygen and recall thinking to myself, this is how I'm going to die, defending this entrance. So another cop who, yeah, he thought that that was last moments. But there he's talking specifically about the, the pro-Trump chants, them saying, choose the right side. Like, they are talking in the language of a coup. We're coming in, we want the defenders of democracy to join us so that we can succeed in overthrowing it. But again, Jason, you're supposed to ignore all of that. We don't, we don't know who politically these people were, God only knows. But the cops sure seem to know. They did. My silence. Is saying a thousand words. I mean, you have another, and I was I wasn't silent for long. I, that's not my nature. <laughs> that's um, true. It's uh, still a record. Yeah, it, it sure is. It's, it's, it's a cold brew. Um, again, another person, John, that a, a firsthand account and saying the same thing, giving I mean, giving more behind the scenes of the scenes we saw to further corroborate what's what happened there, what what went on, and. And I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't have anything else to say that I haven't said already here, or, or just on Twitter or anyplace else about this. That it's just, it's just, it's very indicative of the country we live in. And great point about it's, it's worse than what about ism. It's just there's just no. It's, it's inhumane to me, and it's. Like yeah. Well, I, 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 I mean, what, what do, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Well, I mean, what I say is I like I, I instantly think, if you had asked me five years ago. If this were to happen, would they defend it? I would say, well, I hope not. So now I wonder, what if they'd blown a big portion of the Capitol building up? What if they had uh, killed five cops? What if they had killed Mike Pence? What line would you have to cross before Tucker Carlson wouldn't have done six months defending them? Is it any of those? John, right, I don't know. You're right, and it's it's a shame. First, John, brilliant question because I think that is that's where the rubber meets the road. And but I I, I would imagine honestly, and here's how crappy of, of uh, how down the gutter of my thought process is. Even let's say they did murder someone in Congress or someone in the executive branch that was super important. I mean, they're all important, but someone that was like really crucial to our American government. I still feel like. They would, they would, media and these super against staunch supporters of their, of, of their rhetoric would be like, well, you know what? He's just a casualty. Yeah. One. And then two, they would still try to spin it and try to justify what happened. Mike Pence would have been, or anyone that would have been in time, that would have been like, well, you know, that's just what happens. You know, like it's for the yeah, great. Or, or like, you, the the worse the thing you have to cover for, well, then the worse the conspiracy theory needs to become the defendant. Like if Tucker Carlson spent a couple of weeks saying the FBI did this and then moved on, he doesn't even talk about it anymore. And everybody's just like, oh, that was a fun thought experiment. I guess we don't, it didn't matter that he said the FBI caused it. Well, then if they killed Mike Pence, that's the FBI. Well, it's gotta be the FBI now because they did something really bad or it's somebody working for the CIA or God only knows. Um, they would come up with something to excuse it. They always will. And like, it's not like there's less call for political violence today than there was six months ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it's going to be, what it's going to look like, who are going to be the casualties, but they are going to kill politicians. And then we're going to have to do a show the next morning. Talk about here's what Sean Hannity said to defend it. Here's, uh, you know, Tucker Carlson saying this is a distraction from. Oh, the ruling class or whatever. We're gonna have to do that. That's the job we're gonna have to do because it's the country we unfortunately live in. Right. Now, really fast, a couple more details on Ganell. He's an immigrant from the Dominican Republic and a naturalized US citizen. He said one of the Capitol writers, quote, saw my skin color and said, you're not even an American. So that's fun. And then on uh, Trump saying that the MAGA rioters were hugging and kissing the police, he said, quote, I'm still recovering from those hugs and kisses that day. If that was hugs and kisses, then we should all go to his house and do the same thing to him, which is fiery. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking there about Trump, but but yeah, they they millions of people believe yeah, it was just hugs and kisses. It was fine. Simultaneously, it was Antifa terrorists, and they were just doing hugs and kisses, whichever it needs to be. 
at any given second for me to not have to think about the natural path that uh, the political ideology I'm a part of is going for, uh, toward. <laughs> anyway, look, we're gonna have more on this. It's going to get even darker and it's gonna get even more <laughs> racist, um, but we do have to take our first break. So we're gonna do that, but stick around. A lot more really terrible footage coming up after this. Okay, so our first segment had some rough footage. In some ways, it might even get a little bit harder to watch as we launch into this next section. Officer Harry Dunn was testifying before Congress this morning, and he had a lot to say, including the clear racial element in the mob that attacked the Capitol. Let's take a look. I told them to just leave the Capitol, and in response, they yelled, no man, this is our house. President Trump invited us here. We're here to stop the steal. Joe Biden is not the president. Nobody voted for Joe Biden. I'm a law enforcement officer, and I do my best to keep politics out of my job. But in this circumstance, I responded. Well, I voted for Joe Biden. Does my vote not count? Am I no? Yeah, sort of understandably. Yeah, Jason. Um, one, I'm glad that C-SPAN allowed for that officer to say verbatim what happened to him without bleeping him, without him being preempted, without any kind of, of editing, because that is the country we are living in, right? That, that, that's real. Those filthy people thought they had that they, they, they could disrespect someone who, who has given their life to protect and serve at all costs, right? And he said, what, what, I mean, beyond being, beyond, beyond, I mean, I've been called the N word a lot in my life. So to me, it's like, that's all you got. That's the best you can do. I mean, just don't call me ugly. Call me whatever you want. Just don't call me ugly. That's a fight. <laughs> but, oh my but, God. For, but for, for, him to say, you know, in my years, all my years on the force in uniform, in uniform, I've never been called that. And this was someone who also had his physical life in jeopardy. But listening to the intonation and the tone, him being called that word pierced him to his soul. You could just tell, by the way, he is present in what happened, re revisiting, being re-traumatized yet again about what happened on, on, on January 6th. So if I'm glad that that mainstream media outlet didn't 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 yeah. mince, let mince words. They said this is the good, the bad, not even the good. This is the bad, the ugly, the very ugly, and the Medusa ugly of all of this. You know exactly. Um, and and for those that are watching, because you know we have a huge audience here. Not everyone, not everyone is you know a hater or a troll. But for those that are watching that are still saying that racism doesn't exist, that the MAGA people aren't. The, oh, they're not racist. They just believe in 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 capitalism and all these things. There's your proof from from the horse's mouth, from a stable of horses. Racism is alive and well in the United States, folks. Racism is alive and well on the right. Yeah, yeah, and look, it's clear that they're not just racist. They're perfectly willing to murder white cops too, but they're definitely racist. You don't, yep. yeah, I don't like. There's not a lot of people in the MAGA crowd that's like. Yeah, it really it disheartens me that these people, these brothers in arms, politically um, sometimes say things that are racially insensitive. I, I wish that we would evolve in that way. That's not going on at these marches and these crowds, uh, unfortunately. And so I, I agree with Jason, totally right. Like that, C-SPAN not censoring it is so important for people to understand how raw, how ugly it is, especially and. We'll see if they end up seeing it. But those who've uh, you know gone through more than six months of stuff like this from Tucker Carlson, there's no evidence that white supremacists were responsible for what happened on January 6th. That's a lie. Month after month after month, broadcast after broadcast after broadcast to millions of viewers denying that there was any racial angle to any of it, despite the shirts, the the you know, pro-Holocaust shirts and things like that. Yeah, there's just nothing. It's it's just people who disagree a little bit or whatever, and they're probably Antifa anyway. No, we know who they were. We know what they came to do. And Harry Dunn was a very important part of people getting that message. The the power of what Harry Dunn said, his ability to make the case, is the reason that Tucker Carlson launched the preemptive war against him. And that war, bet every dollar you have, 
will continue later on tonight. And we're gonna see just how ugly the counter strike against Harry Dunn is going to be um, later tonight on Fox. And to, to how could, you know, I understand a job's a job. You know, Tucker Carlson, it's paid millions of dollars. He's a very prominent face of Fox News. But as a journalist, as someone who's, as you know, your job is to report the news factually and factually. And to even to have, you know, we, when, we love sources like a Harry Dunn that we can go to who was boots on the ground, experienced exactly what happened on January 6th and can yeah. get their first hand account. That's great for news outlets because we that's what we want. We want to report the news and that is news. So for Tucker Carlson to go on national TV and to ignore that, if Tucker Carlson was worth his salt as a journalist, he would invite Harry Dunn on and have a dialogue with that person with Harry Dunn on air versus launching, wasting time, looking like an idiot, acting yeah. like this hasn't happened. That to me is good journalism. That to me, I mean, I don't watch Fox News. I don't. I, can, I mean, Tucker Carlson's either here nor there for me. I prefer Megan Megan Kelly on Fox News, but she's she's now. I don't know what Megan Kelly's doing these days. She's, she's a, a podcast, I think. Right. She was YouTube. Now she's a podcaster. Wow. Yeah. Fall from grace. Fall from grace. But um, not far it, enough. But not far yes. enough. Yeah. But shout out to podcasters, but not Megan Kelly. But Tucker Carlson, it's. It, I mean. As a journalist, you need to, instead of trying to be a puppet for your employer, which I guess he has to be, why don't you do the right thing and do the right thing? You know? Yeah. So I'm excited well, to see what you say tonight, too. We'll see. I, I, I could be wrong. Maybe he wants to bring Harry Dunn on so he can attack him. I, I sort of doubt it, though. He doesn't. He brings on people who will help him to make the case that will push for what he wants politically. We, we saw who's the economist from. From Denmark years ago, if you come on and you disagree with him, if you being there doesn't help him advance the narrative, you don't come back on. That's not what happens. So Harry Dunn is not going to back down from Tucker Carlson's attacks. And I think Tucker Carlson gets that. So I doubt that any invitation has been offered. I could be wrong. We'll see, but I sort of doubt it. I doubt it too. You know, Fox News, what, what was their slogan? I'm not sure it's that anymore. Fair and balanced news, anything but yeah. fair and balanced. The, 100%. Such a joke. Yeah. Okay, let's go to um, one more of these vid videos. Uh, uh, DC police officer uh, Daniel Hodges uh, was one of the last that we were able to watch before going live this morning. And he had uh, among the darker experiences to relate about what happened on the 6th. Here it goes. I attempted to rip the baton from my hands and we wrestled for control. I retained my weapon after I pushed him back. He yelled at me, you're on the wrong team. Cut off from our leadership, which is at the front of our formation. We huddled up and assessed the threats surrounding us. One man tried and failed to build a rapport with me, shouting, are you my brother? Another takes a different tack, shouting, you will die on your knees. They weren't violent, they, were just, they stayed within the lines. They were like tourists, we have senators. Who are still saying that and will still say that after watching cop after cop after cop say, these people were saying they were going to kill me. They were trying to kill me. They did serious damage to me. Tomorrow, senators in the you know the most distinguished deliberative body in the history of world governments will say, um, no, they were just they were just there um, taking a look at things. They were tourists, not a big deal. Why are you worried about this? Right. I mean, you by know the way, that. I believe, well, really fast, I believe he was the cop. There's the video of him uh, being crushed by the door in the doorway. I believe Daniel Hodges was the officer um, in that video. More video, right? S cell phone activism at it its finest do right it, here. Yeah. But, but, but no, no, we need more proof. We, we have, okay, so we have cops on the stand, emotional, distraught. We have video, we have audio. You know, no, now we need for God to descend upon the earth and to mm -hmm. completely like, I don't know, glamour us like they did on on uh what's what's that um the the, the vampire show on HBO with Sookie Waterhouse. True blood. Um, true blood, glamour us and make us like see everything and compel us. No, the proof is there. The proof is there. And yeah. you know, I will say this. Hopefully, forget Tucker Carlson, forget the media. Hopefully. Justice will prevail in the legal system. Hopefully, people will be held accountable there, John. Yeah. I feel like that's our last, that's that's the last frontier, and it's not much of a frontier, but that is the last frontier for accountability and culpability. Yeah, yeah, and and, and some have. We'll we'll see how it proceeds. Um, 
a country should be able to look at an event like that and draw something like the right conclusions from it. And Agreed. we're gonna see if that's what we get. In 10 years, what will people think when they think of January 6th? If they think of it at all, we're deciding right now what that's gonna look like. Okay, um, um, we are the Philly Stefanik. Ugh. We're gonna we're gonna get to the the counterattack tomorrow. I'm done with it for now. So we're gonna take a short break. When we come back, uh, the Olympics is on. We're gonna really switch it up tone wise and <laughs> launch into some of the, the developments on the Olympics before getting to other political news. Uh, so consider this the the thing to uh, wipe the taste from your mouth of the awful political violence we have in this country. Uh, we're gonna take a break. We'll be back in just a few. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. It's me, John Arola and Jason Carter. Let's yep. jump into some very different news. Unfortunate news for the Olympics this morning. Uh, Simone Biles had to withdraw from the women's team gymnastic final in the Olympics. It is obviously bad news for her many, many fans. Um, you know, women's gymnastics is generally one of the sports people most look forward to. She is one of the most accomplished, if not the most accomplished women's gymnasts in the history of the sport. So we're sad to see it, we wanna give you the details though. While performing her uh, Aminar vault during the first rotation of the team competition, she only managed one and a half rotations and landed awkwardly, prompting gasps from onlookers. Um, she exited the competition after the vault and headed off the floor with a team doctor. She came back to the arena, hugged her teammates and watched the rest of the competition in her warm up uniform. At the time, there was a statement saying um, from USA Gymnastics saying she had to withdraw uh, due to a medical issue. She will be assessed daily to determine medical clearance for future competitions. Now she has since said um, that uh, I just didn't wanna go on after that performance. I'm just dealing with things internally that will get fixed in the next couple of days. No injury, thankfully. It's been really stressful this Olympic Games. I think we're just a little bit too stressed out, but we should be out here having fun. And sometimes that's not the case. She uh, later on said, um, gym, there's more to life than just gymnastics. So initially they'd made it seem as if she had injured herself in the vault. It apparently was not the case, um, but you know, she at least for now will not be competing. There is of course also the um, individual all around there, are the individual event uh, competitions that'll be taking place. Uh, no word yet that I have found about whether she will be competing in those. Uh, but Jason, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I mean, look, Simone Biles said it, quoting her, you know, the weight of the world is on her shoulders. This is someone who is very decorated as a gymnast. This is the Olympics. Of course, last year in 2020, they were they were postponed because of the pandemic. Four years is a long time to be training for this. Also, she is, you know, every Olympiad has the story, the stars in 96, Atlanta, Carrie Strug, the Atlanta Six. Every single Olympiad has that one person, uh, Michael Phelps, the list goes on and on that you're watching for, right? They become the stories, the celebrities the narrative for you for the US beyond the scandal that Team USA Gymnastics has had with of course with you know the in, in appropriate behavior of the past gymnastics has always been something that has been at the forefront for the Olympics that's that's what we watch that's prime time that's great TV and Simone Biles is young and also she's at a space in her life where yeah she has the medals but she's realizing much like Naomi Osaka who talked about mental health that's yeah. important right the pandemic John and everyone watching we people can stop and say hey I wasn't affected by that but you know we all were affected in some way shape or form even world class athletes and as yeah. someone who's been training for five years now to be here in Tokyo, which is a really weird experience watching the Olympics now because there's no audience. The fanfare yeah. is not there. The news is constantly saying, oh my, it's a $20 billion failure. That affects an athlete. And she's like, I didn't have the best performance and I don't owe anyone anything, right? I don't owe you guys anything. I'm a human being, let me live. So I commence, I commend, I commend, I commend Simone. And I think it's um, funny how USA Gymnastics, of course, the PR team had to make sure they were ready with that statement. Yeah. That was in alignment with what you would say. And Simone's like, skirt, heart swerve, pivot, full stop. Nope, that's not what we're doing. Here's the And she's honest. Deal. Yeah, she's honest yeah. and I and I appreciate that. No one's gonna take away from her. Even if she doesn't do well this Olympiad, no one's gonna take away from who she is in sports history. And yeah, she's, she's already had all those wins. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. Now this is just like, okay, cool. You know, fine. What's what's another gold medal when I have four other yeah. ones? What's what's another gold medal when I'm in the Guinness Book of World Records at such a young yeah. age and I've changed the game of the sport? 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't owe it to anyone. Nobody can touch her. Literally, she'll just flip over you or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. If she doesn't want to compete, she doesn't like have to. And and there's and there's others on the team who will. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the Carrie Strug thing on social media. Many people were using the experience of Carrie Strug back in 1996 to attack Simone Biles. Um, first of all, as a person who watched that Olympics, that's what got me into Olympics and gymnastics. Screw you! Like, right. first of all, don't get, get Carrie Strug's name out of your mouth. First of all, second of all, like, it's weird to use that as like, so you should hurt yourself because someone else did. So first of all, like, and there's people are helping to add the context. She didn't have to. She was like forced into it by Bella Caroli because right. he couldn't do the math to know that they'd already won the gold. She didn't need to do the second vault. And then, and then also, of course, she was like carried off and then handed to Larry Nasser. So, like that, that time was dark. Okay, let's not say that women should be obligated to be in the sort of situation they were in then. Anyway, especially because Simone Biles, I believe, is one of those who's talked about um, the legacy of abuse in her own experience. Mm-hmm. There. So she can do whatever the hell she wants, honestly. Um, and the rest of the team is amazing. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about the results because I have this really weird attachment to not having things spoiled. And I know some people are going to watch it later. But anyway, they got a great team. Don't worry about it. Okay, yeah. with that, you want to turn to some good news? Let's pivot. Okay, let's do that. So, <clears throat> uh, Yesterday on the show, we talked about the fact that the Philippines, for the first time in 97 years, got a gold medal. They had a weightlifter who got a gold medal. That was awesome. In the US, the first ever individual foil gold medal. A woman got that. And now today, with a population of just 63,000, Bermuda has become the smallest nation or territory to win an Olympic gold medal for the first time again in about 100 years. Flora Duffy clinched the victory for the British Island Territory in women's individual triathlon, a grueling race made up of open water swimming for nearly a mile, biking almost 25 miles and running 4.6 miles, or what I would call just death three ways. But anyway, she did it and got the gold. She crossed the finish line with a time of one hour, 55 minutes, 36, or one hour, 55 minutes, 36 seconds, I believe, more than a minute ahead of second place finisher. Um, Georgia Taylor Brown of Great Britain, uh, the American won the bronze in that. You know, Bermuda is the second Olympic medal of any kind, by the way, for Bermuda. Isn't that amazing? Since well, yeah, 1976. Her workout consists of her just running around the, the island for a day. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> she swam around the, the island. whole thing. Yeah, I mean, this is not, that's a walk. That's a walk in the park for her. Hell, I'll do that at the Olympics. That's what I do every day. I get up, I run around the island, I swim around the island, and I'm done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's just kidding. No, congratulations. So, uh, you know, John, I know you're a huge fan of the Olympics. I too, I'm more of a winter, a winter Olympics kind of guy. I remember getting into the one Olympics I remember the most was '88 Seoul, Korea, and then um, when I was 12 for Barcelona 1992. I just remember just the stories and and just how magical the Olympics are because they come once every four years. You have mm-hmm. you have the logo, the the how the IOC selects the city seven years before, you know, and yeah. just it's the bidding process. It's it's all so magical and powerful. And now thinking about Tokyo, which Gord, I think this is the second time that Tokyo's had the Olympics. I'm not, I'm not, I could be wrong. Um I, no I'm sorry, Beijing had it twice, uh, winter and summer. But um this year just feels off for me. It just feels off. I I it, it feels like well, it's, everything is off. But yeah. you know they're they're still trying. I've been watching a lot of different sports, sports I've never watched before. It's still fun, you know. It's not the exact same thing, but it can't be, and it's not on the athletes. Um, you know, I I I think there is still a magic to it, and it is that like you none of us generally get experiences like this. Like you sure. you work and you do all that stuff, but it's not all leading up to this one huge thing. We like that the crystallization of so much work. Getting to see it, um, and so well, yeah, congratulations to the athlete yeah. from Bermuda. You you said the crystallization, John. I mean, just the 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 vocab, John. You God, you're you're otherworldly, brother. In 19, I should get the gold medal in that. Right? Yeah, you should. You should definitely <laughs> because like crystallization. I mean, the words you use are just like. Wow. Um, <laughs> in 2004, oh I think 2003, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali ran the Olympic torch came through Albuquerque for Athens because uh, 2004 games were in Athens. And I just remember the city because they ran through Route 66 mm-hmm. and that goes through Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I just remember 
such a moment, right? Like it's like Haley's comment. You're never gonna experience that ever sure. again in your life. And uh, it was just it's just so magical. And it's funny how when you're younger, four years seems like a long time, right? Four years like, oh my God, we gotta wait another four years for the Olympics, but now it's just it does come. Right. It does right. come. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on to just give you a little bit of an update on what's going on actually in Tokyo. Um, this won't be a full story, but you should know that uh, they were worried about COVID being spread if the Olympics went on. And whether it's caused by that or not, COVID is spreading. They uh, just reported 2,848 new cases of COVID-19 in Tokyo, specifically breaking a previous record set in January. And so that, to put it in perspective, that is right around or slightly higher than what we have in LA County. And I'm like, I think of it as being really bad in LA County. And there, they only have about 25.5% of the country's population being vaccinated. 36% have had one dose. So it kind of feels like a little bit of the predictions are coming true. Although, again, we can't say to what extent. The Olympics specifically is responsible for it, Jason. Well, right. I mean, people are gonna all. I mean, you can't until they. There, people are automatically gonna assume because this is like a huge gathering, if you will, of people. It's a huge event. People are gonna be flocking to try to see these things at the Olympics or at the hands of all this. But question for you, and question for the viewers: Like, why are people? No, this is probably the dumbest question I'm gonna ask for 2021. But why are people <laughs> not not getting vaccinated? I don't get it. It's, I understand fear of needles. I have a fear of needles. I cried at Publix here. I my husband had to hold my hand. I'm 41 years old. Really, what's going on? But why are people hmm. not? Well, there. So so obviously there's it's complex even in the U.S. But in a lot of these other countries, they can't get enough of them. Like right. countries like the U.S. and other wealthy countries. Um, are the ones who have the pads, they're producing it and they're buying up international supplies. So um, I, I, I can't say for sure it's possible there's some anti-vax sentiment in Japan that I don't know about. But in a lot of these countries, it's just not available. Like I saw um, a report, Namibia has had one dose according to a report that I saw so far. And there's tons of people that would love to have it. They just literally can't get it, it's just it's not available. And remember, there was this push to get, um, a patent waiver for producing for international production of the vaccine and the country enough countries including the US didn't support it so there's not the waiver they can't produce their own vaccines and so they're basically just held hostage just waiting until eventually the supplies are available and right now they're not wow. but anyway that is all the time we have for the linear hour so thank you everybody for who joined us for that there is a lot of other news coming so if you're on Twitch or YouTube don't go anywhere we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back after this Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.